So I'm a pretty big nerd, but I also like to think I'm pretty social. So when you add those two things together, it means science pops up in a lot of the conversations I have. And before long, I'll usually mention immunotherapy, and the most common reaction I get is, what's that? Um, and then I'll say that immunotherapy uses our immune systems to cure cancer. And at that point, I'll see a lot of people's uh, curiosity turn to skepticism. And some people will ask if it's like an alternative medicine or something. And I understand that. I mean, the idea at first that your immune system cures cancer does sound a little bit like wishful thinking. <coughs> but I assure you that immunotherapy is very real and very legit. In fact, I'm sure you're already familiar with immunotherapy. You've just never heard it called that. So basically, immunotherapy is just a way to help our immune systems fight disease. We've already used it against polio and tuberculosis and smallpox and many other diseases. We call them vaccines, but they're really just a form of immunotherapy. Um, however, fighting something that's clearly an outsider, like a virus or bacteria, is one thing. Fighting cancer is something else. Uh, it's, it's much harder, and it's because the disease is much more complex and much more subtle. It's our own cells that are rebelling against us. <clears throat> Above all, what makes cancer cancer is its uncontrolled growth. But if you look beyond that growth, cancer is extremely complex. And that's why we're good at treating tumors when they're small before they advance. But as they get larger and they progress and they develop new tactics, uh, our current treatments, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, don't really work that well, which is why cancer still kills one out of every four people in this country. Luckily, we've learned a lot more about both cancer and the immune system, and we've gotten much better at using immunotherapy to empower patients' immune systems and help them to overcome cancer and conquer it with their own bodies. <coughs> so it was actually, uh, immunotherapy actually started 125 years ago with a New York City surgeon named William B. Coley. He read about a patient whose, neck, whose tumors all over his body disappeared after he got a really bad infection. And he was intrigued by this connection. So he decided that he would purposely infect a patient to try to cure them. And crazily enough, he actually didn't need any permission for this back then. Probably wouldn't have gotten it today. Um, but in 1891, he actually treated a man named Zola, uh, infected him with bacteria. And he had several large tumors, including one in his throat, that made it so he couldn't even eat, and he was near death. And although he actually almost died from the infection, uh, within two days, his tumor started to shrink, and he soon resumed his normal life. Coley and a few other doctors had some successes with Coley's toxins, as they came to call them. Uh, but a lot of doctors didn't really take the approach seriously. Our technology wasn't that advanced then, and the technique didn't really, it was hard to replicate. Uh, and beyond anything else, we just didn't really know that much about the immune system. In fact, Coley himself didn't even realize that the immune system was responsible. He thought that it was something in his mixture itself that was directly poisoning the cancer cells, hence the name toxins. So like the pacemaker and a lot of other breakthroughs in the history of medicine, immunotherapy also benefited from a little bit of luck in the beginning. Fortunately for us too, while the medical establishment largely, largely dismissed Coley's work, not everybody forgot about it. One was his daughter, Helen, who in 1953 founded the Cancer Research Institute, or CRI, where I actually work now. Now, in 1953, no one believed in immunotherapy, and CRI, for several decades, was the only organization that actually was devoted to advancing it. <coughs> um. And one of, one of the, we, we still actually fund a lot of researchers around the, doctors and scientists around the world, not only to figure out base, the basics of the immune system and how it works, but more importantly, taking that knowledge and then translating into life-saving medicine. And probably no one, and no one has been more important to immunotherapy or CRI than Lloyd J. Old here. And he actually worked at the same cancer center that Dr. Coley did, which is now called Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I think it's safe to say that without his contributions, immunotherapy definitely wouldn't be where it is today. One of the most important things that he, uh, one of his most important contributions was he helped us figure out how the immune system identifies other cells. And it does this by looking at the molecular markers on cells. So in, in this case, it, can look, it looks at our cells, determines if they're healthy or not, and then figures out if it needs to do anything about it. And the situation's a lot more complex than this. There's a lot more types of markers, a lot more types of cells. But this is good at capturing the idea that at the root of the immune system's power 
is its ability to physically interact with and make sense of molecules on other cells. Um, and although you don't really need to pay attention to the colors too much, just going forward, keep in mind that anything that's red is involved in the immune system's ability to, con to recognize and then go after the cancer. <clears throat> so the way that the immune system does this is actually pretty complicated, so I'm just going to cover a few of the basics. First, we've got general immune cells uh, that basically are on lookout duty. As you can see, they don't have any of those red receptors to actually target the cancer because that's not what they're designed to do. But as tumors grow and start to disrupt their surroundings, these immune cells are alerted and then they start to do a little recon. And they'll figure out, they'll go and they'll interact with cancer's markers and figure out what it looks like. And then after that, it can actually coordinate a overall immune response and develop customized cells that are specially designed to target the cancer. Now, our immune system will normally do this and help protect us, but unfortunately, tumors often develop ways to protect themselves against the immune system. And sometimes the immune system needs a little help, which is where immunotherapy comes in. So one way that tumors are protected from the immune system is through molecules called checkpoints, which you can see here, these receptors on the cells. Um, now, when these checkpoints get bound, they actually act as an off switch, and they shut down the immune cells so that they can't attack the cancer anymore. Luckily, we've developed checkpoint or immunotherapy drugs called checkpoint, checkpoint blockers that act as, in a sense, uh, caffeine. They help keep the immune system active and awake. And so when these checkpoint blockers go in here, you can see that they interfere with that receptor and prevent it from being turned off and help the immune system stay on and carry out, uh, continuing to eliminate the tumor. The first checkpoint was actually FDA, got FDA approval five years ago. And since then, we've got several more have been approved for several types of cancers. And they've helped many patients that were previously untreatable. In melanoma, which was the first, drug, first cancer that they were approved for, they've actually doubled five-year survival rates already. Unfortunately, they don't work on all tumors. So to tackle these harder-to-treat tumors, we're starting to use the checkpoint immunotherapies in combination with other immunotherapies that I'll be talking about in a little bit. And the goal of this is to basically stimulate and empower and enable the immune system to go after cancer. We also realized that some of our old treatments uh, also have the ability to stimulate the immune system, so we're starting to use those in combination with immunotherapy as well. One of these is radiation. Uh, for the longest time, we just used radiation to directly kill the cancer cells, which is good, but more importantly, uh, when the radiation hits the cells, it can cause them to release their markers, which will alert the immune system and allow it to come in, and it'll see what the cancer looks like, and this allows it to eliminate the rest of the cells that are still there. And the, using radiation in combination with immunotherapy is actually what helped former President Jimmy Carter. When his melanoma metastasized to his brain, the doctors first zapped it with radiation, and then they added one of those checkpoint blockers that I talked about to give his immune system a little boost and allow it to continue finishing off the cancer. Another way that we can stimulate the immune system is through viruses. Just last year, actually, the FDA approved a modified herpes virus to treat melanoma. And they did this, this works by, uh, they first remove the bad genes that cause herpes and replace them with good genes that help the immune system. So after these viruses are modified, they're injected into the tumors where they infect the cancer cells. And then uh, the first thing that happens is the cells will start to produce that uh, molecule that will recruit the immune system. Then the cancer cells will die. And then when they die, they'll release their markers, which further stimulates the immune system and allows it to form a strong attack against it. We're also developing more personalized immunotherapies, and one of these is called CAR T cells. In this, doctors take immune cells from the patient, and uh, then they actually help make them into, they transform them into a stronger version that's better at finding and targeting the cancer. And there's a number of ways they can do this, and we still honestly don't know the best one. One of them, for example, could be uh, removing these checkpoint receptors that we know turn the immune cells off, and instead replacing them with the receptors that allow the, uh, allow the immune cells to go after and target cancer. One person who's already benefited from these is Emily Whitehead. Uh, she was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of five, tried a bunch of different types of chemotherapy, none of them worked. Uh, but then she got CAR T cells in 2012, and amazingly, they eliminated her leukemia and have allowed her to live a healthy life since then. Now, CAR T cells aren't FDA approved yet, but they've been tried in hundreds of patients in clinical trials. And in leukemia and lymphoma, 
they've worked on about four out of every five patients, which is an absolutely incredible success rate. Um, so hopefully, I, I expect the next couple of years, we'll start to see some of these become FDA approved. And then hopefully more patients can benefit just like Emily has. Another way that, another type of personalized immunotherapy are vaccines. Now, normally when we think of a vaccine, we think of something that helps prevent a disease, not treat something we already have. And while we may eventually be able to develop a vaccine that helps us prevent cancer, right now we're focused on using vaccines to help treat people that already have cancer. So there's, there's many different types of vaccines, but above all, their job is to uh, educate the immune system about what the cancer looks like, tell it what the cancer's markers are. And now the reason that these are considered personalized is because every tumor has its own unique mutations. So what you tell one patient's immune system won't work for another because the two tumors look different. So once you get this information to the immune system, again, it'll be able to coordinate that, that overall response and develop those customized cells that are targeted specifically to that tumor. And we still don't know the best way to make a vaccine. We don't know what makes the best vaccine either. We're still figuring out what's the best information to deliver, as well as what's the best way to deliver it. Um, but we are making great progress, and we're also starting to figure out ways that we can uh, rapidly figure out what mutations a, a patient has, and then convert that into a vaccine quickly, and for hopefully the most success. And I, I would, these are a bit longer term, but I would think within the next decade, we'll really start to see some of these succeed as well. Unfortunately, uh, both the vaccines and CAR T cells and the checkpoints, by themselves, they'll never work for every patient. Um, and because we can, we can tell the immune system what to look for and we can give it powerful cells, but that's useless unless the immune cells can actually get into the tumor, which isn't always possible because some recruit cells that act as bouncers and they literally block the immune cells from being able to get in there. So these other cells that cancer recruits to support it are a whole, they, another level of uh, complexity to the whole issue. And unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about them today. I also won't have time to talk about the 100 trillion bacterial cells that live on our skin and in our guts that influence cancer as well as our ability to treat it. And not only, they, they not only affect cancers of the gut and of the skin, but they actually influence our immune system over our entire body. So bacteria in your stomach can actually influence cancer anywhere else in your body. And tumor, the cancer cells and the immune cells also compete. So for instance, they fight over precious resources in the tumor. And if the tumor cells win over the immune cells, the immune cells starve and they actually can't do anything else about it. Um, so my slides earlier made it seem fairly simple for us to use the immune system to fight cancer. But the, the environments that tumors create around themselves are extremely complex, and there's many factors that control it. And those factors also vary from patient to patient. So what we need isn't a magic bullet. In fact, the magic bullets probably doesn't exist. Um, different, patient, different tumors and different patients uh, always need different strategies. So <clears throat> rather than a single magic bullet, what we need are just several great bullets, some of which are the immunotherapies I've already been talking about, and more importantly, we need to know which ones work best against which types of tumors. So by designing the treatments specifically for patients based on the characteristics of their individual tumors, we can tell the immune system exactly what it, we can give the immune system exactly what it needs to be able to go after the cancer. We're also making other advances besides the treatments themselves that will benefit patients. Um, as I said earlier, if the earlier we detect cancer, the better the, better the likelihood that we can get rid of it. Um, and we're developing remarkable ways that we can detect cancer earlier. So soon, you might even be able to get tested for cancer just by a simple blood draw or even a saliva sample. Um, we're also constantly learning more about the immune system, which will help us refine and improve our, uh, our strategies and allow it to really get after cancer. Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot more work before we turn those possibilities into realities. Luckily, a lot more people are starting to get on board in immunotherapy's potential and invest in it. In just the last year, we've had several major groups launched that are focusing on immunotherapy, including the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, the Bloomberg Kimmel Immunotherapy Institute at Johns Hopkins, and the Cancer Moonshot, which was launched by Delaware's own Vice President Biden. So people always ask me if I think we'll be able to come up with a cure for cancer. And honestly, a couple years ago, I, I didn't think we would. I thought that cancer's complexity would be too much for us to tame. But with, the, with how far immunotherapy has already come, 
in addition to the amazing breakthroughs that I see happening every day, I know we're on the right path. And even though it may not be possible anytime soon to save every single person from cancer, I, have great, I very strongly believe, and more important, have great reason to believe that eventually we will be able to conquer this deadly disease.